Konnichiwa, Samurai James here. I'm going to be covering a video by Weird History about is it actually worse to wear medieval armor than nothing at all. Now a coworker of mine sent me this video and said, hey, you wear armor and do sword fighting and stuff. Is this actually real? And I took a look at the video and there's a few points that I want to address to the statements that they make. So the first fact, plate armor has a surprisingly long history. That's accurate. It goes way back to the Romans, and plate armor has been around for thousands of years. That might seem like a little bit of an exaggeration, but plate armor is actually still in use today. I'm not talking about in HEMA context or LARPing or anything like that. When you look at the soldiers, they have their bulletproof vests, their flak jackets. They actually have plates that they put in the front to help with, you know, basically resisting or stopping bullets. Now, a lot of times these are ceramic plates and they're not actually made out of steel, but if we're saying simply plate armor as plate, then yeah, it's still around today. Now, if we're just talking about a piece of armor that's made out of plate in World War I, they actually had helmets that they were prototyping that were made out of steel that they were using in actual battle. They were not widespread because they were testing out the prototypes, but that means up until the 20th century, steel plate armor was still used, at least in some pieces. So in this picture that they used of the Romans, as far as I know, the one on the right is actually fabric armor, a linothorax or something like that. So they're talking about plate armor and they're actually showing fabric armor. Now in this example where they're showing the three suits of armor side by side, the one on the left is a German Gothic style, the one on the right is an Italian style, and the one in the middle is what is affectionately known as the Bashford Dean Frankenstein armor because it was sort of pieced together and it's not completely representative of what medieval armor would have been back then. I mean, it's a very close look and it's something that for many decades was assumed to be correct, so I really can't fault them for using this image. Now, as far as the fullest suits of armor were intended for jousting rather than warfare, to some extent that is accurate. There are very, very, very close parallels in the type of armor that was designed for a joust, that was designed for the battlefield. I'll probably have another video coming up that's talking about garniture armor, and that's what some of the jousting armor was. But it's not just the joust that was friendly competition. I'm going to put up a picture of Henry VIII's armor that is the most encasing suit of armor from the medieval period. It covered everything except for the palms of his hands and the soles of his feet. That was a tournament armor, but it was not meant for jousting. It was meant for fighting on foot. And yes, it even protected the groin and the butt, with what I like to call the utmost in buttmost protection. Okay, they said that jousting armor was the glamour armor, and again, partially accurate, but the thing is, armor kept up with the fashion of the times. Armor in its later evolution, and since we're talking about plate here, was plate. Plate can be shaped as their techniques with the armor increased, so did their ability to shape it. And the thing is, civilian fashion changed over time. Plate armor changed over time. When you see the earlier breastplates that are sitting here, that are across, that's when civilian clothing was similar to that fashion. When you get into the later periods and you see the civilians wearing doublets and the noblemen that have that sharp, deep ridge to it, you get what is called the peace god breastplate that actually develops the ridge going down like that. Now, why is this important for glamour armor, as they called it? Well, armor was a symbol of wealth. If you were wealthy, you could be ransomed. So having fancy, expensive, pretty armor on the battlefield, one, protects you because it's still armor. And two, increases your odds of survival, not in that it's better armor, but in that you are more likely to be taken ransom rather than outright killed if you have modern and fancy armor. That means you're worth something to be captured. If you're against a, you know, a knight that's wearing armor that's 20, 30 years old or modern stuff without any embellishments whatsoever, they might not be worth as much. Now, granted, they're a knight, they're still worth some money, but when part of your income or all of your income is by taking people hostage and fighting battles, the thing you want to go after is the highest amount of income. And that means taking out, um, and by taking out, I mean capturing, you know, taking hostage and ransoming the people with the fancy modern armor. Those are the people with the money. Those are the ones you were likely to get your ransom from. Now, is this always the case? No, there's always a chance that you're going to catch a stray arrow to the eye or something like that. You might get, you know, stabbed by somebody who's not worried about taking your ransom. 
you might just piss off somebody that you're fighting with, and they're going to end up killing you out of rage without really thinking about the ransom aspect. So it certainly wasn't a foolproof way to say, I have bling armor, so nobody's going to kill me, but it gave you better odds. Now also, with the title of this video, Ways That Armor Was Worth Than None At All, let's take a scenario here. I'm a mercenary. I'm out fighting, and I want to take somebody for ransom. Which one am I likely to kill, and which one am I to take ransom if someone has fancy armor and someone has no armor at all? Because I tell you what, the guy without armor, probably going to die. Not just because they don't have armor and they're an easy target, but because I don't see any point to trying to take them hostage unless they're surrounded by some sort of entourage or have a crown or something else that speaks volumes to me that says, I've got a lot of wealth, please don't kill me. I'm just going to kill him. I'm going to try to take ransom with the guy with the fancy armor. Okay, it's a stretch to say that we associate knights today because of fancy jousting armor. Many people see battles and knights that were in battles in books, and they wear very similar armor to what they're wearing for jousting. So to say that we associate the modern day image of a knight with jousting armor is incorrect. There are some people that associate knights with jousting because that's one of the things that they were very well known to do. And in that case, that is somewhat correct. But since we're speaking about armor in this video, pretty much incorrect. The difference between jousting armor and field combat armor is often very, very small. And the majority of people won't even be able to tell you what the difference in it is. And also he said blocky jousting armor. Is, is this blocky armor to you? Does this look like Minecraft? Come on. Okay, so jousting armor is fine for jousting, but it's not useful on a battlefield because of limited vision and movement. Okay, look, there's a couple people doing responses to these videos. I've fought in armor many times. I have owned armor for almost 30 years at this point. So I'm going to speak to you from the perspective of somebody that has worn armor, that does historical European martial arts. This is not LARPing, this is trying to fight with historical techniques, using historical armor, and fighting as warm. You stab the plate, it doesn't do anything. You slash the plate, it doesn't do anything. So understand my perspective on this. I'm speaking as someone who has worn this stuff and done things with it. Can armor limit your movement? Yes. Does armor limit your movement as much as most people think? I'm going to say generally not, because I don't know exactly what most people think on this. Most of my friends are into armored stuff, so I have a different pool than what the general public may be. However, when we've done demonstrations at the Ren Fair for seven, eight, maybe nine years now, the public in general thinks that a knight knocked on his back can't get up, and that's simply not true. I've not only been knocked on my back in full harness and stood back up multiple times, there was one fight where I was fighting with one of the other guys at a demo. He got me into an arm bar and down on the ground. I managed to actually 360 roll on the ground like some sort of weird metallic alligator spin out of it and regain control. So not only can you move fine in armor, you know, it, it does limit it a little bit, but it's not as much as you might think. The biggest thing that limits you with jousting armor or jousting in general is the fact that you're on a horse. There's things you can't do on a horse that you can do on the ground. And counter to that, of course, you can do things on a horse that you can't do on the ground, but armor has a lot of movement to it. Now, I don't want to overcorrect so far and say that armor doesn't limit your movement in any way, because it does. And the amount that it limits you is also somewhat directly relevant to the quality of the armor. A really well-fitted suit of armor will move better than one that you get off the shelf or something that is not made to your size and your measurements. I've had both, and I can speak to the perspective of wearing both. The off-the-shelf stuff will work, and it will limit you some, and that limitation goes down as you get custom armor. Again, it never fully goes away. Full suits of armor, head-to-toe with plate, will limit you in some way, and certain styles of armor limit more than the others. So there is some limitation, but it's not as drastic as they're making it out to be here. Now with regards to where they're talking about it limiting your vision, does armor limit your vision? Yes. How much? That depends. There are many different types of helmets. I've worn a few different types of helmets. And in the perspective of someone in the armor, when you're talking about the early armor with something like a great helm that you maybe saw in my drawing video there, you have fixed eye slots and you have some breath holes underneath. 
And because of that, you can see not only out of the eye slots, but also out of the breath holes. So in this video where they're showing as if you can only see through the slot here, that's pretty common with jousting. If you have something like an armet that you may have seen on my Milanese armor, that has the visor that comes down, and then at the bottom it also has a wrap plate that goes underneath, so you can only see from within this window. But if you're on the ground and you're fighting and you need a little bit more mobility and or vision, you can take the wrapper off. And if you have breath holes on one or both sides of that helmet visor, just like with the Great Helm, you can now see in front of you from the slots and a lot of in front and semi-peripheral from the breath holes underneath. Now, it might seem like you're looking out through a cheese grater, but since those holes are very close to you, your brain does a lot of this like weird voodoo magic stuff that you can actually see pretty well like that. Um, you know, I've had many people try on helmets and they're surprised at how much you actually can see because they have the perception that the helmet just makes it so hard for you to see and everything's like looking out of a little viewfinder. And in many cases, that's simply not accurate. Not to mention, in helmets like the Armit or the Clap Visor or others, they have visors, and visors can lift up. So if you're on the ground and you need to catch your breath, you need to get more vision, you can actually lift up the visor. If I need to assess as a commanding officer, I can lift up my visor, take a look around, hope I don't take an arrow or sword to the face in the interim, spear, whatever other weapon may be coming my way, decide what I need to do, catch my breath, put the visor down, and go about my business. Armor wasn't bolted on you into place, with few exceptions, which again are actually jousting specific and not battlefield specific. So when they say it as inverse like that, they're actually not only getting things wrong, they're getting it backwards as well. So it protected them from a lot, but it didn't make them invincible, and it created more problems than it solved. Yet, it was around for, uh, you know, hundreds of years as full plate armor and hundreds of thousands of suits made in varying levels of quality. So, yeah, it was definitely junk, those idiot medieval peasants. Yeah, that's... Soldiers were literally baked inside of their armor during the Crusades. Okay, yes, they fought in a desert. Yes, deserts are hot. But we're talking about the Crusaders, so what we're talking about here is mail with little bits of plate here and there. Here's an example of some 9mm mail. You can see, hey, I can see you through this, right? Well, let's take a look at the 6mm. This is a six millimeter standard that I need to get a fabric backing and everything installed on, but for right now, I'm gonna hold it up to make my point that, hey, you can see me through this too, right? It doesn't cook them inside out as they're trying to portray here. That's just nonsense. I have personally worn this suit here, which weighs 85 pounds. It is heavier than the historical one, and I'm gonna hit that in a little bit when we get to one of their other facts, but I've worn that 85 pound suit of full plate armor with mail, in 99 degree temperatures and fought multiple times a day in historical European martial arts with it. Now, is that a battle? No, but suffice to say, I'm probably one of a handful of people that at least has the experience of wearing heavy armor like that, wearing it outdoors, wearing it in over 90 degree temperatures and fighting in historical methods with it. So, will it bake you alive? Not really. What's going to happen is you're going to get heat exhaustion and a few other things like that. You're going to dehydrate, but to think that you're going to sit there and bake alive as if they were burning you at the stake like a witch is complete nonsense. And keep in mind, you know what else can kill you with heat stroke? Is not wearing armor at all. So it's not like the armor caused heat stroke to be a thing. Yes, it's a little bit warmer having the warm metal rings like that, but you're going to have cloth underneath. And it's also, as I said, you can see through it, it's going to breathe. When you get that breeze, that's going to help cool you off. It will be warmer than not wearing the mail at all, but it's not going to kill you, and it's going to reduce your chance of dying if you end up in a battle. Some took their armor off entirely when it became too warm. Yes, if you're marching and you're not expecting imminent battle, then you can certainly take the armor off. They didn't live in the armor. This isn't what they did. The armor was to protect during a battle. So if it was hot and you wore something hot, 
you would take it off. You don't walk outside and when it's 85 degrees outside with a hoodie on and say, kind of warm out here, but you know, it might snow tonight. I'm just going to go ahead and keep this on. Then you're going to feel kind of dumb when you overheat. And you know, that's probably correct. You, you should. It's 85 degrees. There's no threat that it's going to snow. Just the same. If there's no threat of a battle, you're probably not wearing your armor simply for marching or for moving from one place to another. They had pack mules, knights had people that worked with them and under them that would be carrying things for them. They didn't have to wear it and lug it around as if it was their three-piece suit every day as they're going to work. Okay, I just saw that they said it could leave one vulnerable if fighting broke out with taking it off, but still, point stands. They're trying to make that as if a way that armor is more dangerous than no armor at all, and that's simply not the case in the way that they're trying to present it. Now again, they doubled down on it, and they said to the cooking point. Again, there is no real cooking point that you're going to hit in natural temperatures with male armor. That's just not how it works. You're going to die from heat exhaustion, from thirst, dehydration, something like that, which can be sped up a bit by the armor, but it's never going to roast you alive. Now they're talking about wearing a coat over top of the male, and yes, that's what we're used to seeing is you'll see the male and then they'll be wearing a surcoat over top. Is the surcoat an extra layer? Yes. Is the surcoat fabric? Yes. Will fabric also breathe? Yes. Not as well as no fabric at all, but one of the trade-offs on this is now you've got that layer of fabric, but you're also reducing all of the direct heat that's hitting the metal that's heating it up. So what you have is armor that is not as hot as it would be without wearing the surcoat. So not only do you have the surcoat to help balance off some of that trade-off and extra heat from an extra layer by lowering the temperature of the armor, the surcoat also provides a second function of, in some cases, troop identification, because you can see this guy's got Saracen gear and this guy's got Crusader gear. It's pretty easy to know who your friends and enemies are in that case. If everybody wore the same armor, you wouldn't know who's who. But beyond that, the surcoat is also helping protect the armor from the elements to some extent. You get sand kicking up and everything, you know, that can be abrasive to the armor, which in most cases will help polish it up and everything. But once you start getting sand and a bunch of it, you know, it starts to become gritty, it's going to feel weird, it's not going to move quite properly unless you shake it off and move around a little bit, and it's just worse to have sandy armor than no armor at all. And again, Speaking from experience here, I actually wore my armor to the beach one time just to see what it'd be like, and here's proof. So yeah, sandy armor, not quite as good as not sandy armor. So a surcoat over top to help with the heat and keep the sand and other elements off the armor, better. Next fact, you could get stabbed between the plates. Yes, I mean, I think that's fairly obvious. That's how Roman armor worked, that's how medieval knight's armor worked, that's how samurai armor worked, that's how futuristic armor 85 billion years from now is going to work when everything is lasers and weird robots and stuff. If a thing exists and it's two pieces of a thing and there's a gap, then things can go in between the gap. But this is a real big stretch to say... I don't know. I mean, if I had, you know, I'm a Roman soldier, I've got my Lorica Segmentata, and I've got my Greaves on. Well, I mean, I guess I could get stabbed in the thigh. I don't even know why I'm wearing this. Now your entire body's a target. So again, it's not worse to be able to be stabbed between the gaps of the plates than wearing no armor at all. When you wear no armor, everything is a target. Wearing some armor reduces the amount of targets. That is better than not wearing armor at all, which, again, complete opposite of what they're trying to depict in this video. I'm going to give them credit. They said that plate armor made soldiers nearly invincible and that sword slashes did nothing. Thank you, weird history here, for not following Hollywood and assuming that you simply cut through armor with a sword because, you know, the armor doesn't exist or doesn't function. So I'm going to give them credit for that. However, I'm going to be knocking points off for what they talk about here soon. Now they talk about the gaps in the armor and how you want to exploit those places. Again, I'm a student of HEMA and have been for 10 years, both in class and on my own. I've got, you know, dozens of books on it and everything. Spend quite a bit of time learning how to use a sword and how to use a sword with armor. That's been the focus of all of my HEMA days has been armored combat. I do some unarmored stuff, but I've always been a lot more into the armored. Without further digression on that, they point out the neck, the armpits, and the groin. Are those targets? 
Yes. Are they showing an actual suit of plate armor here for both of them and pointing at the neck, both of which have solid plate all the way? Yes. That's not a target if the plate covers it like that. You're not really going to be getting through it. But that's not really the point that I want to make with this. There's a few other targets, the palm of the hand, the inner elbow, the armpits, the neck where possible, the eye slots, the groin, the back of the legs, including the knees, because for mounted soldiers, the back of the legs is not armored. If you've ever seen these and thought, well, that's really weird, when a knight is sitting on a horse or a man at arms, I'm gonna use the term knight interchangeably here, but just a person in armor is sitting on a horse, the back of their upper legs is covered by the saddle and the horse. So that part doesn't get armored because then you can't feel to ride the horse around. It simply has to be unarmored because of that. There are special suits of armor, particularly for the English who fought unmounted or dismounted, whatever the proper term there is, where they actually have the fold, the skirt to the armor, comes down further and it's not split in the front because they don't need to sit over a saddle as well as protects all the way around the body. They also have upper leg protection that has not only the front and the partial plate that you'll see on some of them, it actually goes all the way around the thigh because again, they don't have the horse or the limitations of such, so this protects even more. And this is one of those cases where an actual battlefield foot armor can be more protective overall than jousting armor if you took away the horse from the equation. Now out of that, there are two different tiers to these sort of targets because the palm of the hands is almost always going to be a very good target because at best they're probably wearing leather gloves and that's going to be sewn into their gauntlet. That makes it a good target because there is nothing steel there. Going back to my experience with fighting someone with armor, I fought someone, Ed Borkowski, he's a friend of mine that I met through HEMA. He has a fantastic suit of armor by Jeff Wasson that's a very close replica of one of the Wallace ones. I don't remember if it's A26 or A19, but um, if I can find out what it was, I'll drop it in the thing down here when I edit. But anyway, it covers really, really well. It has large pauldrons that close up the shoulder very well. There is an opening underneath that you can get to, but you can't stab forward. You have to get underneath at very strange angles to get to it and he's actually got those articulated strips on the inner elbow, so his entire arm from wrist up to here is completely covered. And on some, such as Henry VIII's armor that I mentioned, even the lower armpit is covered because they had essentially a circular piece uh, with one of the armors that Lauren Helmsmith, I believe, was the one that made, that actually goes all the way around and essentially moves sort of like a tube, like you would see on like sci-fi or whatever, where they have like corrugated stuff, or if you look at your vacuum where like you bend it around and you see it's a tube with like these ripples in it, that's the same sort of principle that they use to fully enclose the arm like that. Now that was very expensive and you know both materials and time to do that sort of thing, so it didn't happen very often, but they did have the ability to do it and it was pretty much just strictly for extremely wealthy and royal people because those are the people that wanted to stay alive and would spend the money to do it. Which goes back to the point of, if armor was actually more dangerous than not wearing it, why did all of them wear it? Now moving on to a few other things, with the armpits, the armpits will almost always be guarded by secondary armor being male again. Sometimes this is a hauberdin worn underneath of the plate, especially with something like a coat of plates, or in the early days when they had just a breastplate or a breast and a back plate without a fold. And sometimes in the later period it moved on to something called voiders, which is essentially patches of mail sewn to an arming garment that's worn underneath of the plate to provide that extra protection. So while you might be trying to thrust at the armpit, might be trying to thrust in the elbow and get in there and simply stab somebody by going between the plates, let me show you how difficult that is. All right, for this, this is an Albion Talhofer. You can see the blade comes down and tapers to a point. It's a diamond cross-section blade. It's a very stiff blade. This would be what you would be half sorting with and working with when you're trying to fight someone in armor. Now, I've got armor on my inner elbow. Let's say they're actually able to stab the armor. Well, this is 9mm male. You can see there's a couple inches worth of the blade that gets through. Is that going to kill me? Not immediately. I might bleed out, but I'm still going to be capable of fighting for a small amount of time. And that's assuming that they can get all the way through here and get purchased without breaking any links. 
let's take a look at this with a six millimeter male. I'm gonna have a dedicated video covering different types of swords against different types and sizes of male, so keep an eye out for that one later. But you can see here with a six millimeter, very fine male, there's almost none of the, the tip of the sword that gets through here. This is maybe a quarter inch. With a couple layers of fabric, that's gonna be a superficial wound, almost certainly, which means you might be able to stab me in the elbow and you might get into one of the holes here in the mail, because again, you're gonna to have to actually get into the mail. There's a good chance it's gonna hit and skitter off or that you might hit it, and you know, in this case, it, it's not even pushing through, so you gotta get you know, just right, because this is in the inner elbow, even though it's a single layer of mail. If I have my elbow bent like this, you might have to be stabbing two, two three layers of mail as it kind of folds up on itself a little bit and the weapon is coming in. It's not always as simple as you see in these examples where they put a sheet of mail on top of something and then try to stab it. That's wrong because you're not always going to be stabbing just one like that, and it's also providing a very solid surface to try to stab through. Debunking of some of those tests is, once again, another video, so we'll cover that later, and I'm going to try not to keep going on to tangents like this. But suffice to say, mail is in a lot of those other places. The one place it's not going to be is in the eye slots, and generally not in the back of the leg or in the groin. There are a few things, such as the fold, which that's going to be mail that sits in front of the groin, but not around it, as you might think of with a pair of pants or a pair of shorts. There's a type of male garment called a brayette, which is essentially male shorts. Um, you know, it, it actually wraps around, pulls up, and has a flap there. So in that case, once again, you're going to try to stab there, but you're going to have to contend with the male as well. Your best bet is the eye slot and the palm of the hand. So as you're going after these targets, the only real targets that are going to be an imminent threat to you are... The slots in your the slot in your visor, the eye slot or slots as the case may be, and some helmets are actually just perforated plate that didn't even have a real slot slot that you could get a weapon through. The vast majority of those in tournament context, but I'm not going to rule out that there could have been a handful that ended up on the battlefield. But as a general rule, you would have an eye slot that you're going to have to worry about defending. You're going to have to worry about your hands. Depending on the armor type and the time period, you know, your neck may be exposed in some manner, so you're going to want to keep an eye out for that. The inner elbows and the armpits are less of a concern. They are still a concern, but they have protection there. Again, same for the groin. It has protection. Is it protected underneath? No. Is somebody going to be rolling up on you and trying to shank you up underneath like that? Probably a dumb idea, because if I see any of that coming, I'm going to be stabbing at them on the ground, I'm going to be stomping them, so it's just not practical in the way that people say, I would just stab them where there isn't armor. Look, I've, I've tried doing this for 10 years, it's nowhere near as easy as it sounds. Going back to Ed's suit of armor, which I'm going to put a picture up here again, just for point of reference, there is almost nothing that I could stab at here. I had extreme difficulty with trying to get under to get at his armpits, because he's simply very good at guarding them. He wears the armor, it's made for him, and he knows exactly what the weaknesses are. And, as a gentleman's agreement in the tournament, he said, you know, please don't throw me, I don't want to mess up the armor. And I said, hey, not a problem, that's cool, we're friends. Extend me the same courtesy and don't throw me, and we're good to go. So, we did not throw each other. So what did that leave me with? That left me with the armpits, the inner elbow is nothing, the neck is nothing. I had the eye slots, which is an extremely hard target to hit. And that is an accurate statement. However, I also want to stress that while I've done this in about 10 years, uh, I've also seen twice where a dagger has gone into the eye slots of armor. I'm not saying the dagger hit near the eye slot. I'm talking the weapon went into the helmet, blade inside. By extreme luck and grace, no one was injured in either case for that. One of them ended up, I believe, taking a, you know, a bruise to the around the eye area or the nose because we're using blunted weapons that are safe for fighting like this. Still, that's one of those things where, with my group in particular, everybody has perf plate. And with that perf plate for safety, over the years, we were allowing eye slot shots and in one case, I actually had a dagger, and we were doing pole arms and everything. I ended up tossing my pole axe because I was getting ready to close in real quick, and I was pretty certain on this gamble. I raised my arm up like this to catch the haft of my opponent's pole axe right here, 
I drew my dagger and I went bang right into the eye slot. I got really lucky with being able to hit that target because again, these are people, they're moving. You know, I, I was hopeful that he would be focused on hitting me and not really watching for me to come with the dagger so quickly. And I got him in the eye slot like that. What we realized afterwards was I dented that quarter inch thick perf plate. This is quarter inch thick stuff. This is thicker than regular metal armor would have been, but not heat treated. And because of that, we made the judgment call that, hey, we've actually multiple times hit each other in the eye slots with blunt weapons. Again, not around the eye slot in it where it would have been straight into the eyeball of somebody in real life. So to say, oh, this person's wearing armor, but it doesn't cover them 100%. I'll just stab them where there's no armor. That's very much the sort of thing that someone who has never been in armor or fought someone in armor or much less had experience with it and fought an experienced person. That's simply something you don't say because that's not the reality of it. And if it was, then you wouldn't have seen hundreds of thousands of people in the medieval period wearing armor because they would just say, I'm going to train more so I'm not as you know tired and out of shape and I'm going to be able to blah, 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 and I'm just going to stab them where there's no armor. That's not how it works. Now, is grappling a thing in armor? Yes, grappling is a thing in armor. It's in the manuscripts, and they talk about it as a core part of the fighting systems from the masters. Does that often involve a dagger? Yes. Why does that involve a dagger? Logistics. Once you're in close, a longer weapon like a sword or especially a spear can be more of a liability than an asset. That doesn't mean in all instances it's a liability. You know, you can always choke up on a spear and grab it towards the tip, but you have the long end of the handle going out there. And at that point, it's sort of like a dagger, but it's extremely awkward dagger. It's not as good as having actual just regular dagger to it. A two-handed sword at that distance can be more of a liability because you're trying to manipulate something further out to be able to get into those openings. Now, where it can be an asset is, since you're in armor and you have this, this is also something that functions like a lever. So if I'm able to get near my opponent, I might not be able to stab at them. But again, swords were sharpened around the bottom third or bottom half of the blade. Half sorting is a thing you can do, especially with gloves and the un un unsharpened part of the blade. So if I'm able to pretend there's a head here, get my sword wrapped around my opponent's head like this and use it as a lever. I can use this to wrench him to the ground or get him into a position where he's essentially going to give up and I'm going to be able to ransom him. And I didn't have to kill him at all. Their armor protected them as armor is supposed to do. And I was able to use my weapon in a semi unconventional manner without even having to defeat the armor. So in this case, was the armor a liability or an asset? because I was able to capture them, I was able to bring them to the ground, and the armor didn't protect them. No, it's still an asset, because if they didn't have the armor, I wouldn't be doing that. I would simply take my sword, and I would run them through, or slush them up, or almost anything else, because, hey, their entire body's a target. They don't have armor. And now, once again, when we're talking about ransoming, you know, when you're getting into a grapple for things, and you're beginning to pull daggers, as you're trying to get into those openings, if I take three or four, you know, stabs from a dagger, let's say they get it into the armpit and pass the mail, I might get stabbed three or four times and it's not going to be fatal because, hey, I've got armor on and it's helping protect me. I'm going to cry uncle real quick and say ransom and hope that I don't bleed out and I'm actually able to survive it, which again, the armor did its job and protected. And even though someone stabbed through the gaps in the plates, that didn't make the armor useless or more of an impediment than it would be for a benefit. So again, the premise of this video is once again flawed. They said it would be, you know, guaranteed that it's a painful end. And that's simply not the case because again, there might be no injuries if I simply cry uncle and end up getting ransomed. Or it might be superficial injuries if, you know, the male does its job and protects me. So again, they're trying to say that, oh, you had armor on so people had to be really aggressive in how they killed you. People were really aggressive in killing you without the armor, and you were, you know, in a really bad situation without the armor to begin with. So, again, this is not something that made the armor more of a hindrance than a benefit. It's simply not how that worked. And they also talk about going through the eye slots. Again, they're assuming that armor is simply attached to you and doesn't move. I myself, again, in my own personal experience, I've got a German clap visor helmet. That's what I usually do my armor combat fighting in. 
And in the early days, the very first day that my nephew was <laughs> learning how to do some of this armored combat, he'd been coming to shows with us for years, but we put him in armor for the first time, and I said, hey, uh, we'll go ahead and fight. You know, it's, it's a demonstration for charity, raise some money for Make-A-Wish here. I'm not really going at your hardcore. It's not a tournament. Nobody's taking home medals. We ended up fighting, and, you know, it was a fairly normal fight for most intents and purposes. But an interesting thing happened. With the clap visor helmet, there's a little slot. You know what? I'm going to show you. So here's my buddy Clappy the Clap Visor Helmet. You can see it's got a hinge here, it's got a faceplate on it for the visor, and it's got a strap around it. Now the strap helps keep the visor from popping open, and in combat this would also be a useful thing. But one interesting thing that I learned, and how I broke my nose, my nephew is a lefty. We were doing daggers, we fought with swords and daggers until we got the score to 2-2. Two to two. We did sudden death with daggers only to encourage grappling and just cool stuff for the crowd to see. And uh, as we were going, he was swatting and I was swatting, so dagger in one hand and then trying to use the other to keep batting away the opponent's dagger. Well, he managed to hit my, my little guy like this, and it knocked it sideways. And what happened? Since I was moving around, this little hinge here slipped. And the visor went down a bit. And I'm going to link the video down here below. We've actually got it on video when I broke my nose. Uh, the visor dropped enough for me to take a dagger right to the eyeballs. Uh, right here in the bridge, right between the eyeballs. That sucked. And uh, you might notice this little round dot here. I've solid riveted this so that it won't happen again in the future because I like not having to have my nose broken. So the point of that is you might end up getting stabbed through the eye slot. But if you have a type of helmet that has a liftable visor, such as an armet, if it's not secured, then they can lift the visor and there's a whole lot of space that they have to stab at you with. But once again, that goes to show with the visor down, when you have armor, it's harder to kill you than if they lift the visor up and stab at you. Armor made it harder for people to kill you. It did not make it easier or worse for you to wear it. Bravo to them for saying that, yes, armor was restrictive, but you might be surprised how much mobility they had because that's accurate. So, hey, good facts. A tin can with legs. Don't, uh, okay, they're, they're just using it as a fun term to get some extra clicks, some views, some laughs, whatever it is. Knights in armor were not tin cans with legs. Sorry to Campbell's. Sprint around on the battlefield, swinging your sword like a LARPer in a cardboard costume. Uh, maybe I should have kept the Tonto out. Sprinting on a battlefield is almost never a thing, certainly even less of a thing with fully armored people. You're going to fight in formations, you're going to be, for the most part, approaching into range slowly. Sprinting is an easy way to trip in armor. I have tripped in armor due to sabatons, with catching the little toe, the metal pointed part of the toe, into the grass and falling forwards. That happens, that's the last thing you want to have happen on a battlefield because the chance of getting trampled both by your own allies or horses is a pretty realistic thing, so you certainly don't want that. So sprinting on the battlefield is just not a thing. They're watching too many Hollywood movies where you see everybody run at each other and clash together, or they're playing too much Age of Empires where they're like, yeah, full on, charge, ah! Just not really a thing for the most part. And also, LARPer in a cardboard costume, I'm going to assume they're saying this for comedic effect. Needless to say, a lot of LARPers don't have cardboard costumes. They also aren't wearing realistic armor, but still, to say that it's cardboard, and then be showing these people fighting in what looks like at least some reasonable armor. You know, they seem to have some steel on. The one guy on the left with the black and red with the little rivet pattern there looks like a uh, Katangu Dengo, um slaughtering the pronunciation on that, but it's one of the eastern types of armor. So they've got swords, they've got shields, they seem to be doing what I believe is some sort of SCA type combat here. Um, you know, I can't read the sign in the back, Bawa something, so I'm guessing it's overseas. 
but still, they're, you know, they're making a good faith effort, they're having fun with their game, and at the end of the day, that's what counts. Okay, for the comment about suits of armor could weigh up to 100 pounds, this is a very common misconception, it's something that I thought we had kind of squashed over the last decade or two, that's clearly not the case, um, you know, props to Shad for his version of this video, I haven't seen the whole thing yet, but... He showed where you can find on three seconds in Google that's not the case, and no, that's really not the case. Yes, some rare cases, armor did weigh 100 pounds, and what you're talking about is jousting armor that had multiple pieces of reinforce where, you know, they have the solid arm here that has a removable piece, they have a breastplate that has, you know, fixture here to actually attach something to protect their neck going all the way up. They're adding all these extra and thick pieces of armor because they know they're jousting, they know it's quasi-friendly competition, and they're not out on a battlefield. So having 100 pounds of armor in that case for the joust was simply safer for the participants. Some suits, like if you've seen my video with the Milanese suit, that's actually got the removable elbow on it, it's got the removable shoulder on it, so that adds a little bit of extra weight to it. When I mentioned earlier that my suit right there actually weighs 85 pounds, that's for a combination of reasons. One is financial. Hey, this is not what I do for a living and I can't afford to blow all my budget on this sort of stuff. So that armor is all 16 gauge mild steel. What does that mean? Well, that means some of the plates on the armor are thicker than they would have been historically. So historically, that suit probably would have weighed 65 to 70 pounds if it was in heat-treated carbon steel, allowing for thinner plates and also for plates of varying thicknesses. Does the knight have a sword and a poleaxe? Probably. If he's on his horse, does he have a sword and his lance? Yes. Does he have the poleaxe? Probably not. He's going to have a squire, a man-at-arms, a retainer of some sort that will have the poleaxe, that will have a few other things, you know, to help protect their knight if they fall off the horse, need protection, if they need an extra weapon. A lance is a great weapon on a horse, but it's kind of junk on the ground. Likewise, a poleaxe is a really good weapon on the ground. It's a lot less useful when you're on a horse, so certain things provide benefits in some situations and not the other, just like the armor does. You know, the squire, the man-at-arms, if the knight is knocked off the horse, that might be the person that pulls the wrapper off that arm so that they have more head mobility while they're on the ground to fight. There's a lot of different situations for this, and it's gross oversimplification to say that the knight is just overburdened with all of this stuff on top of all of their armor. That's simply not the case. The sword hangs at your belt on an assembly that takes virtually no effort from you to carry. It's an extra few pounds. It's, it's just not what they're making it out to be. Now, as far as expenditure of energy, they said twice as much, and I don't know if they pulled this number out of the air, but that's actually pretty accurate. Like I said, I've fought in armor a bunch of times, and I can't really mathematically say this takes me twice as much energy just because I don't have sensors and whatever else to figure this out, and at best guess, sometimes it just depends on the day, how rested I am, what I've been doing before, did I do yard work, did I sit around and save up my energy? But the cool thing is, this is actually accurate. There was a study about 10 years ago in Leeds where they checked out people on a treadmill with sensors hooked up and everything wearing a suit of armor to see what is the heart rate, what is the energy expenditure, how does the armor impact you in this fashion. And they did a really good job of it because they didn't grab a handful of people out of the lab and say, we're throwing armor on, you get on the treadmill, let's see what this does to you. They took people put them on a treadmill without armor, and put them on the treadmill with armor. But these were people who already wore armor, who have armor, who are experienced with the armor, which is very important because once you have the armor and you're used to moving in it, you won't try to move in the weird ways that you might feel a little bit restricted with. Your armor becomes like a second skin, both in, you know, it protects you as a second suit of skin, but you wear it enough and it becomes a second nature to you. You, in, you know, just intuitively begin to know, like, I can only lift my arms this much. I don't need to keep lifting higher than that. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that you'll learn as you wear the armor that by having people that already wore armor in this study, they did a great job at having a proper sample set for this and not having extraneous variables. So yeah, this twice as much energy in armor is pretty accurate. 
So by wearing armor, you would often find yourself fighting someone who was less exhausted than you. That's... That's also just not really how that works. I mean, as someone in armor, you may not be the initial front line that goes forward. If they're sending out skirmishers or, you know, light infantry up front that has a little bit of armor or no armor at all, these are the people that they're saying will have a lot more energy. But the thing is, they may have already been engaged in battle for 5, 10, 30, 60, 120 minutes before I even get up here to start fighting with them. So if I'm a properly trained knight that's in good physical condition, that is used to wearing the armor and fights for their life in this, I'm going to be pretty conservative with how I'm using my energy and I'm going to know how to move around in it and I'm not going to be exhausted immediately from the giant ridiculous Hollywood swings and everything else, as they said, swinging, you know, a metal bar at people. That's just not what a good, solid, well-trained fighter does. So, to think that I'm going to be slogging along here, trying to sprint across the battlefield and get slaughtered by someone that doesn't have armor because they're not tired, is nonsense. The best sword fight that's taught in, you know, I believe it's Talhofer, how is the perfect sword fight? Boom. You just hit them in the head and they're dead. That's it. Everything else that happens after that is when a sword fight goes wrong. So to think that I would not have the energy to throw a single strike and kill someone without armor, and they would have so much energy they'd just be able to run circles around me and I wouldn't be able to swing in them, it's nonsense. There is an artifact to wearing armor, and armor takes a bit of a toll on you, but the way they present it sounds like it's coming out of a video game or a Hollywood movie where the unarmored person's going to be like Dark Souls, like, you know... You know, there's the fat roll and the regular roll, and like, oh, I'm in armor, I'm gonna be fat rolling, I can't do it. And the person without armor is gonna have so much energy, they're just gonna, you know, mega roll right behind me and backstab me and kill me. That's not how that works. Now, exact armor terminology and everything on this aside for what they're talking about in the video, can you run in armor? Yes. Does it make you more tired than if you weren't wearing armor? Of course it does. How realistic or practical is running on a battlefield? It's just not something that's needed that often, so it's kind of a, you know, vapor type point. Of course, no video is complete without Agincourt. Did it happen? Yes. Did the French lose? Yes. Did it rain a lot? Yes. Was there mud? Yes. Do they once again say 100 pounds of armor while trying to take the weight of joust armor and present it as battlefield armor? Yes, they did. Is there some cost to trying to walk in armor across the money field? Yes, because once again, haha, <laughs> been there, done that. Yeah, it takes a little bit of extra energy, especially when you're trying not to fall. I've fought in mud and everything before the majority of the time. We won't do that because it's an unsafe, but in one case I actually did, and I believe that was the day that I did that aforementioned alligator roll when I got in the arm bar. So I walked in mud with armor, I fought in mud with armor. Uh, you know, it's it's a thing that happens, but it's not something that makes you incapable of functioning as a person. Ah, the old lances and arrows can just go straight through armor, so why wear armor at all? Well, if you believe that, then obviously you wouldn't, because it's just pointless. But again, hundreds of thousands of people wear armor, and it is pretty good protection against lances and arrows. What we have in a modern day with our cold rolled sheet steel, the steel is homogenized, it's solid, it's got evenly heat treated. We know a lot of things metallurgically that they had some idea of back then. They were not stupid. They figured this stuff out. They were very intelligent people, but they didn't have the ability to interact like we do with the internet and all these other things where we can glean all this information in minutes, hours, days. They were heat treating armor back then, but sometimes you had rough material or the amount of carbon in the steel is not exactly consistent. So you can actually have a weak spot in the armor where certain part of the plate might be weaker than the rest. In that case, is it possible to pierce with a lance or an arrow? Yes, if it's a good lance or arrow and conditions are right, you're close enough to have enough oomph behind the arrow. You know, you got a bow with enough draw weight behind it a proper, you know, punching type of arrowhead. You know, if you've got a broad head, you're dissipating the force, so that's not going to be as effective. A bodkin's a lot more effective to get through with that needle type point. But again, this is a very rare exception. They weren't just sitting back loosing arrows and having it go through the armor, because if that's the case, they would have stopped wearing it. And that even applies back in the earlier Crusader days. 
there's one of the writings that talks about how the Crusaders came off the field looking like a pincushion because they had their padded armor on, they had their mail on top, they were getting shot with superficial injuries from the arrows, arrows that are sticking into the armor and kind of hanging off of them and looking like a pincushion, but again, not killing them. Had a normal person taken four, six, eight arrows to their body, they'd probably be dead, or at the very least immensely incapacitated and probably going to bleed out if they're extremely lucky. So once again, armor works. This is not a thing where it just doesn't function or you are worse off by wearing it than not wearing it. At close range, arrows could smash right through. We've got people who have tried this again today in modern day context and that just doesn't happen. And even beyond that, with some of those tests where the arrow does not penetrate the armor, the armor is not on a person that's getting hit by the arrow, the armor is on an item that it's fixed against and the arrow hits it and bounces off or dents it. But what that also throws into the mix is, if you hit a real life person that's wearing a breastplate with an arrow like that, on these tests, the breastplate can't really move that much. It's affixed to something solid, not moving. If you have enough force behind an arrow that you think it's going to smash through a steel plate, hitting a person with that, with the breastplate, some of that force is going to get dissipated as it makes contact and knocks a person, you know, at least back, if not, you know, potentially all the way onto their back. They're not going to fly in the air like you see through Hollywood and everything, but some of that force is dissipated by, you know, the person moving as that target is struck. So, again, even less likely chance of it to actually pierce than what we see in some of the tests today that also don't work. Could a longbow kill somebody 200 yards away? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, how do you die getting shot with arrows and armor? Well, you get shot in the eye slot, you know, you accidentally take one to potentially the inner elbow or some sort of spot where it's going to do some damage, but that's generally not going to be the plate armor. Even if an arrow managed to get through the plate armor, you know, a bodkin arrow with a two inch tip or something managed to break through the plate, you know, if it punctures the surface of the plate, but the entire arrow cannot get in and the shaft cannot pass through that opening, then what I have is a one and a half to two inch deep stab wound. I'm not specifically dead by that, even if the plate did fail in some way. There's going to be a couple layers of at least linen with the arming coat underneath. And again, you know, if it hits somewhere up here where the male voiders are going to overlap, there's a chance it breaks through the plate some small amount and doesn't even contact my body. But, you know, who's probably going to die getting hit with an arrow from 200 yards away? That's right, the person who is not wearing any armor. Cavalry charges? Yes, they were a thing. Can they deliver blows to people in armor? Yes, they absolutely can. This was done in many cultures and doesn't really have a lot to do with the armor itself. But it's important to note that they at least got this fact right on horses and cavalry. I understand they're going for dramatic effect here, saying a lance could punch a hole through Robocop, but they're saying they had extremely sharp tips and they were excellent at it. Uh, I mean, they designed the weapons as best as they could, but the best chance of a lance succeeding is somebody that's not wearing armor, somebody that's wearing perhaps a coat of plates or something that's got a little bit more give to it, somebody in male armor, not really the opponent in plate armor. With the previously mentioned things, like not all the armor was created equal and sometimes armor has a vulnerable spot, yes, that can happen sometimes, but the biggest punch from a lance to someone in armor is actually going to be concussive force, not penetrating force. Now they're once again saying you couldn't see well. I think I've covered that well enough. In some cases you can, in some cases you can't, and you know, it's a mixed bag. So sometimes yes, sometimes no, but you could always see to some extent. The times where they chose that more protection was more important than limited visibility, then that's a choice that they have to make based on their own situation and you know that doesn't mean that the armor wasn't going to work the more that your vision is restricted the more protected you are but there's a balance in that like many things now they say completely eliminating your peripheral vision and that's not the case you do still have some peripheral vision it is not 180 degrees field of vision out here to the sides but the way that they're showing with a diving helmet where you can see in front of you like a horse with blinders on is nonsense. Even the eye slots that are canted out like this, you still have a reasonable field of vision. 
and also with rare exceptions like the frog mouth helmet and all, the majority of helmets, especially any intended for battlefield use, and I have seen once where they had a battlefield, you know, depiction of a frog mouth, but anyway, not the point. Almost every helmet that was worn on the battlefield, uh, you know, even if this is my field of vision, there's also this thing you can do where you turn your head to look. And if you can't turn your head to look, you can rotate your body. So I might not see all of this at the same time, but when you're talking about dozens, hundreds, thousands of people, in your field of vision that are all fighting at varying distances on a battlefield, the inability to see someone sort of right off to your side or close to your side is not nearly that important. Especially because when we go back to discussing fighting in formation, if I'm here with my poleaxe on the ground and I have other soldiers right next to me that are doing the same, my sides are protected by my allies, so I'm not responsible for protecting myself from 360 degrees. If that's the case, then I would have a montante and be out there doing the helicopter of death. Mixed in with one another, Braveheart style, why are we using movies as a depiction of what medieval combat was like? With Okay, um, yeah, just... No, uh, yeah, battles get crazy, this whole concept of running at each other, swords drawn like that, you know, that's, that's what happens with poorly trained people. That's not the proper way to engage in a fight, and anyone doing that would be pretty reckless and probably killed off pretty early, so, you know, they're drawing conclusions from, from nonsense. Hold on, now plate armor protects you from most stabbing and slashing damage? Wasn't the whole problem with wearing plate armor to begin with that people would just stab you in the ga gaps between the plates? Is that not a thing anymore? Now it's only that they could clobber you to death? Increases your chances of getting a concussion or internal bleeding from a massive blow. Okay, let's go back to old Clappy here. I imagine you can see some of these things here on the side, especially this little crater here. Uh, yeah, all of these things here, these are dents. That's dents in a helmet. You might notice that my head doesn't have holes in it. Uh, those are dents from taking a Morchlog, which is the German word for murder stroke. That's where you flip a sword around backwards and you hit some money with the handle end of it. We did this in some of the early days with wooden weapons and realized it was kind of hurting. But the thing about that is, uh, you know, I never got concussions and I didn't die from it. Granted, we're doing demonstrations and we're not swinging for the fences with this like you would in a real battle. But this is also a mild steel helmet. This is not a heat-treated carbon steel helmet. And the thing about a helmet is, okay, well, I might get hit in the head by a heavy weapon and I might end up with a concussion. That kind of sucks. Take the helmet out of the equation. I might get hit in the head with a heavy weapon, and you know what I don't have? A concussion. Because I'm dead. That's how that works. The helmet kept you from dying. Do you want to get hit with this thing in the head when you're wearing a helmet? Or when you're not wearing anything at all? Because this thing here, that's, that's going to cave in your skull, and you're going to die. That's just, you know, again, this is making an assumption from a perspective of, well, this is a weird thing, and, you know, you could get hit and you could get a concussion. I'm going to make an example here from World War I. They actually started prototyping some helmets in World War I, and they found after these soldiers started wearing these helmets, the amount of head injuries were increasing with soldiers wearing helmets. Now, that doesn't make sense. They're wearing helmets. They should have less head injuries, right? Myopic. You're looking at it in a tunnel here. Did the number of head injuries go up as they wore helmets? Yes. That is statistically viable, but what does that statistic really tell you? It says head injuries increased. What it doesn't tell you if you don't look at the rest is deaths went down. What was happening is people were getting injured and surviving rather than being outright killed. So the amount of injuries going up was a good thing because people were surviving. That's how armor works. 
Now they also talk about dents and how that's going to be terrible and everything and break bones. And in some cases, yes, you can dent armor and break bones. Now you'll note that my helmet has this stuff here. This is padding. What that padding does is it means when this helmet got dented, it didn't fracture my skull. The padding keeps it from making immediate contact. Would a bigger dent hit my skull? Yeah. Would it be a lot harder to do? Yeah. Could you do it with a pole arm? Probably. But, you know, again, you have to be able to hit the person in just the right manner. I've fought with pole axes. And I've fought with spears. It's not as easy as it sounds. You don't just wind it up and then swing at them and hope you hit. There's a whole lot of other things that go into effect with it. And that's discounting from the fact that, you know, you're out on a battlefield with a lot of people around you. You don't have a whole lot of space to be swinging around like this and doing ridiculous stuff to try to get huge amounts of power just to take down one person. You're going to risk hitting your own people or you're going to be far enough apart that things are just going to be weird. So that's, again, just not something that would be practical on a battlefield for most situations. Are there some where it's applicable? Yes. Are they the majority of the time? No. And once again, if somebody has a pole hammer or a pole axe and they make that giant winding swing and they're able to hit that helmet hard enough that it actually causes a dent that goes in that hits your skull and maybe gives you a concussion or causes other issues, without the helmet, you're dead. And also, being able to hit the breastplate hard enough to stop the heart. I mean, that's like these kung fu punch the dude in the chest and stop his heart sort of thing. Hitting a breastplate doesn't make your heart stop. Some other environmental factor causes something like that. And I don't know of hardly any writings that talk about something happening like this. So that's just, you know, the most edgy of edge cases here where they're trying to say, in this one little small percentage chance, this thing could happen. So therefore, armor is just completely useless. Nonsense. Having the strength to land that sort of blow. Now, this basically portrays medieval soldiers as they said, oh, this wasn't all that uncommon to have this huge amount of strength. The vast majority of fighting in medieval armor is not specifically about strength. It's about endurance. It's about technique. And it's about just general awareness of what you're fighting where and how. Some of the techniques for armored combat actually involve breaking bones, which is done while they're still wearing the armor. You know, you're going to go into an arm bar and you're going to be pulling down. You're going to be using it to throw or do other things that will essentially make the armor help lock up and use that to break their bones. That is one of the sort of things where the armor can be somewhat of a hindrance in that they're able to keep a better grip on you once they have your armor. They can grab at the elbow cops, the helmet. There's other things that they can grab onto and use as a lever that you would not have if you were not wearing armor. Now, not a fight I was personally in, but one that I saw, uh, Bob Charette and Bill Frisbee were fighting at one of the tournaments, and Bill had one of those German-style helmets that has the tail that comes out on the back. During that fight, Bob grabbed the back of Bill's helmet when they were in close and held it just long enough for Bill to realize that, oh, he's got the back of my helmet. If that was a real fight, Bob could have twisted and snapped Bill's neck. And that is one of the cases where armor would actually have functioned as a detriment in that specific event, in that scenario. Had Bill not had the helmet at all, then Bob would have just been trying to hit him in the, you know, unarmored head when he had his sword and his spear, and they wouldn't have had to close in. So in that case, yes, the armor did provide a point for Bob to take advantage of, but only in so much that it protected from many things prior to that point, therefore making the armor better than not having armor at all. Did guns eventually get rid of armor? Yes. They said short answer, so I'm going to give them the benefit of not going into this in detail, but yes, guns did eventually cause armor to almost completely fade away. Guns became good at getting through armor. As a response, the armor became a little bit thicker. When the armor became thicker to resist guns, they started shedding pieces off. They started by dropping the lower legs and then some of the arms, and you get to cuirassier's armor. You get to things like the bridal gauntlets that come from the arm up to the elbow, but then they didn't wear anything here, and they wore shoulder protection. Here's a picture of me wearing one here. This is what happened as guns began to get more powerful at defeating plate armor. The plate armor began to taper back, ending up when we have the days of the conquistadors and such. They wore a breastplate and a helmet because... 
Again, that provided some level of protection, even though it had some weight to it, it increased the odds by protecting their vital areas that they might survive. So had that not been the case, they wouldn't have worn it, especially in some of these hot tropical climates where they still wore them at times. It was judged that, hey, this is better to wear this armor and take some of the concessions with it than to not wear it and just be at, you know, large, large amount of risk of basically dying at almost anything. All right, well, to wrap this up, you know, no offense to weird history there. They've, you know, done some research. They put together some pictures and everything and, you know, made their decisions based on whatever information they thought they had available. I highly doubt that any of them have been fighting in armor for a decade or more or, you know, had it for as long as I have or done the sort of things that I've done because most people simply haven't. I'm extremely blessed in that I've been able to do this sort of thing. And I'm very grateful for that. So I don't fault them completely for some of these things. You know, the weight of the armor, as Shad showed, they could have found in a few minutes on Google, sorry, a few seconds on Google. It took me longer to correct that statement than it would have for them to find the correct weight of armor on that. Now, had they picked up a book from 25 years ago that said armor weighed between 50 and 100 pounds, that's legitimate. I mean, I've got some of my early books from that. I've been getting books about armor and swords and stuff since the mid, late 80s. So, you know, some of those old books do have inaccurate information, but this is the age of information and everything. We're here on YouTube. We got the internet. You can find these things out pretty quickly. So books are great as a primary source for that, but, you know, don't, don't disregard the modern methods of trying to find something. Always validate. Don't go off dude's random blog. But once again, I digress. The point is not validating information on some of this, you know. Bravo to Weird History for at least putting this video out there and getting the discussion started. You know, Shad did a video, Metatron did a video, he got his out, you know, a day or two before I'm going to get mine out, so kudos to him for that. But hey, let's get the discussion going amongst the community here, and that's always a good thing. Let's shed some light on the things they got wrong, correct what they did, and then, you know, now we've got multiple sources that are correcting those inaccuracies, so... Hopefully more people will see our corrections on it than saw from the ones that got it, you know, from firsthand from Weird History and had it wrong. So I'm rambling. I think I'm going to wrap this one up. So this is Samurai James saying thanks for watching and sayonara.